University of Russia at NYU. And I'm joined by my co-host here today, Tim Fry from the Harriman Institute at Columbia. This is the New York City Russia Public Policy Seminar Series. Um, this is a series we've been doing for the last uh, now five years or so. Uh, and the series tries to tackle pressing uh, issues of contemporary relevance by bringing together panels of experts uh, to discuss topics. The way this is gonna work here today, just to give everyone a heads up, is that we are going to be um, allowing each of our panelists to have uh, opening remarks of about 10 minutes or so. Uh, Tim Fry will be introducing each of the panelists in turn uh, before they go. We'll put their bi biographies in the chat as well so you can see longer biographies. After that, we'll have a more of a discussion. Um, and because this is a webinar format, Tim and I will be asking questions and we'll take questions from the Q&A in the webinar format. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button on the Zoom screen. If you're watching us live on YouTube, you can use the chat function on YouTube to ask questions. Uh, the nice thing about the Q&A is you're not interrupting the speakers by asking questions, so you can leave questions at any time that you would like. Um, I want to also thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which provides generous funding for this series. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. We are scheduled to go for an hour and a half, so we will wrap up by 1.30 Eastern. And thanks to everyone who's joining us from all sorts of different locations here today. Um, it is a great pleasure to have our panelists here today. Tim's going to introduce them, but today's panel is going to be on Beyond the War, Understanding the Domestic Dynamics and the Prospects of Reconstruction in Ukraine. And I just want to note that we've asked our panelists to think broadly about this, and you as the audience can think broadly about this in uh, question and answer as well. We tend to think of reconstruction as bricks and mortar, um, but obviously it's much, much more than that. There's reconstruction of identity, there's reconstruction of the polity, what the polity means, there's a question of security for a reconstructed Ukraine. So what we really wanted to do with this session here was take a moment where everyone is focused on what's happening on the battlefield, what's happening with weapons, what's happening with leaks, what's happening with a lot of different things, and pull back from this for a moment, which is, I think, one of the things that we feel as the scholarly community that we can offer to the public, but pull back and look a little bit to the future and to Ukraine's future, because the war will end at some point and Ukraine will have a future. And so the question is, we want to start thinking about some of these topics. And so that's what we've asked our panelists to talk about, either in regard to Ukraine specifically or to talk about in a more of a comparative perspective for what we can anticipate. So I'm incredibly excited for our panelists and I'm going to turn and thank them so much for being here today. I'm going to turn this over to Tim Fry now to introduce them. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I too am very excited. I think we've got a terrific group of speakers on an important topic and one in which uh, we should, uh, people with varieties of different perspectives should be able uh, to contribute. And I know I've got lots of questions that I'd, I'd like to ask. But before that, we'll start off with Vladimir Kulik, um, who is the head research fellow at the Department of Political Culture and Ideology at the Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies, the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, many of you uh, uh, know uh, uh, Vladimir's work. Uh, he's a leading expert on uh, language politics, media discourse, national identity. Um, he's taught at top universities in Ukraine and in the United States, including Columbia. And he will kick things off with a discussion about the role of national identity uh, in rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, and then we'll go to each of the speakers for about five to 10 minutes before we get to questions. So, uh, Valdimir, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Let me uh, now see how it works with the slides. Uh, slide show from beginning. Okay. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, national identity, both as a, a resource for, uh, uh, for societal resilience, important source of, of societal resilience in the face uh, of, of invasion, and uh, a, a resource for eventual reconstruction and, and, and uh, uh, kind of assets and, and liabilities, uh, which um, the evolution of identity during uh, the war uh, might, uh, might involve. Uh, so, as, as as we know, Ukrainian society, society uh, demonstrates very strong resilience to occupiers and uh, mass supports for the army and consolidation of society. And uh, uh, national identity was uh, 
uh, has been, is uh, an important source of this resilience. Ukrainians uh, increasingly identify in civic rather than ethnic and linguistic terms, and in this way they are united rather than uh, divided. They are they are diverse, including regionally uh, regionally diverse, uh, but not divided as the Russian propaganda and and uh, under its influence many in the West uh, uh, told us. Uh, despite regional differences, there is overarching uh, attachment to Ukraine as one's homeland. And um, uh, let me demonstrate uh, the salience of uh, Ukrainian identity already before the war. Here is the data from a, a, a survey, Key International Institute of Sociology, all the data here uh, uh, a year before, April, uh, uh, before full scale invasion, April 21. So the question about which uh, characteristics, uh, which um, uh, terms, names best describe a person. And on, on the left is the list, the top part of the list for the sample as a whole, and on the right part, uh, on the right side for Russian speaking part of the sample, for those who indicated Russian as a main language of everyday life. And we see that uh, Ukrainian identity, here uh, Ukrainian, without specification what it means, uh, ethnic or civic or, or mixture, uh, 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 is is the most salient with, uh, uh, with other identities lagging far behind, like gender or, or ideological or religion or social identities. Yeah, even for Russian speakers, Ukrainian identity is more salient than uh, Russian speaking identity. So people uh, may be speaking Russian, but that's not necessarily the most important thing uh, about them, and that's why they are not. Uh, they're not so much apart from from others who who who, who, don't, who speak Ukrainian or other languages. Uh, and so, uh, in another uh, illustration here, we have uh, identity as Ukrainian citizens versus other territorially uh, related identity from local through regional through uh, through national through post-Soviet through European to uh, to global. And, and here is the evolution of, of, of the percentage of those who said that most salient identity uh, is Ukrainian citizen. So the question is, who you consider yourself first and foremost? Yeah. Uh, so um, Ukrainian identity, uh, the salience of Ukrainian identity steadily uh, rose with several peaks. Uh, 2006, it's the Orange Revolution. 2014, it's the Euromaidan and, and the uh, first Russian invasion, meaning in Crimea and the Donbass. And 2022 is the, 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 the biggest peak uh, uh, related to full scale invasion. So, Ukrainian identity is now uh, uh, almost for everybody the, the, the most important territorial identity. So, this local diversification and kind of local segregation of the Razi Gun, uh, it, it used to be a, a fixture, for example, on, uh, on the Donbass. Uh, but but uh, now, of course, uh, some parts of the Donbass are. are uh, unavailable for Ukrainian uh, posters, but uh, where, uh, where, it is can, uh, where it can be conducted, it is clear that uh, most importantly, people think of themselves as Ukrainians, and in this way, they are united. And um, uh, in terms of content of this identity, what it means to be Ukrainian, uh, one part of this content is strong civic attachment. Uh, so Ukrainians, uh, 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 consider themselves Ukrainian because they are proud of being Ukrainian citizens, because they are confident of Ukrainian victory, because, uh, because they contribute to this victory either by making donations or volunteering in some other ways. And uh, uh, what is remarkable, especially in time of war, is that uh, uh, roughly 90% uh, of, of, of the respondents uh, agree with the inclusive definition of Ukrainian. So uh, uh, to Ukrainian nation belong all those who consider themselves Ukrainian, regardless of their language, ethnicity, and, and religious uh, belonging. So which is uh, uh, very remarkable, uh, given that sometimes the war leads to uh, internal differentiation and maybe sca uh, scapegoating and, 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 and divisions in society. Uh, but at the same time, this identity is not exclusively civic. It is inclusive in the sense that everybody can belong, but it is not uh, it, it is not exclusively civic. It contains strong, rather radical, increasingly radical ethnocultural context. Here I provide one illustration. This uh, overwhelming support for the predominance of Ukrainian language in all social domains. Um, in, in a choice uh, of language of preferred language situation between predominance of Ukrainian in all domains and bilingualism predominance of Russian. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, 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 almost half of all respondents uh, wanted Ukraine to be a bilingual country. 
uh, and although the, the choice of uh, Ukrainian being the main language uh, already then prevailed, but increasingly it um, it became more popular, and now fully eighty percent uh, of uh, respondents want uh, uh, Ukrainian to be the main language of all social domains. And another uh, another feature I don't have a, a chart for that here. Another feature is the um, increasing embrace of uh, the nationalist narrative of history, as exemplified by the attitude toward the Ukrainian insurgent army. Uh, that was one of the most controversial um, uh, controversial uh, uh, issue on Ukrainian political agenda for many years uh, because of the Soviet propaganda, which led many. Uh, Ukrainian citizens to consider uh, uh, UPA as Nazi collaborators. Uh, uh, but now, increasingly, uh, people think of them as uh, uh, fighters, uh, fighters for national liberation against uh, Russian imperialism. So in time of war with, with an aggressor, uh, people think of history in terms of, of, of the war with of confrontation with the same aggressor. And, 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 and they uh, look with admiration uh, uh, at those who uh, who they believe fought the same aggressor in the past. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, uh, as I said, national identity was an important source of resilience, but now uh, it, it is no less important to think of it as, as a resource for eventual um, reconstruction after the victory. Uh, uh, the good thing is that Ukrainian identity is inclusive, uh, that uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians' divides, which which were uh, pr pretty salient in the past, are now m much less important. And the regional differences, in particular, uh, even, even though they persist, uh, are much less prominent. Regions are getting closer. In 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 some senses, you you can say that in terms of national identity, especially its ethnocultural context, you can say that uh, the east and the south are uh, catching up with, with the west and the center. But of course, uh, uh, the, this. Uh, radical ethnocultural context in, in terms of language, in terms of history, can, can give, give us um, kind of a reason for concern, because it might be that some people uh, uh, might find this uh, attitude prohibitive, and uh, in this way they will be excluded. And so uh, that might be a problem for, for, for eventual reconstruction, but uh, I think that um, uh, after the victory, uh, the Ukrainian society will be able to work on these issues and uh, will be able to overcome whatever differences uh, it has. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was terrific. Uh, it's really striking that the degree of inclusiveness of Ukrainians' identity has increased during war. That's not, I think, what one would have expected uh, at all. Usually, you would think that national identities become much more exclusive. Um, so that's really fascinating, um, fascinating research. Now we'll turn to Alexandra Koidel. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Public Policy and Governance at the Kiev School of Economics. And she's been a most recently uh, a visiting scholar at uh, George Washington University. Uh, she has a, a book out from Columbia uh, University Press. Notice for each of the speakers, I'll have some tie in to NYU or Columbia. That's all that's all by design, not by not by accident. Um, her book is uh, uh, How Patronal Networks Shape Opportunities for Local Citizen Participation in a Hybrid Regime, a Comparative Analysis of Five Cities uh, in Ukraine. And I think one of the most interesting dimensions of the war effort and, and likely the reconstruction effort will be relation will be the local uh the role of local government and relations between the uh the central government and local governments um and i think you know we've really uh seen uh civil society and local governments play a really important role in the war effort so far so i'm very excited to hear what alexandra has to say thank you very much and uh i'll turn the floor over to you Exactly. Thank you very much, Timothy, having, for having me here and um, Volodymyr setting this very good background for me to talk because we see this uh, mobilization of the uh, civic national identity. Question is, how does it translate into the functioning state that we also observe in Ukraine? And that is uh, a dimension that people forget sometimes, or, or almost taking it for granted, but actually institutions are functioning, local authorities provide water, energy, electricity, they cope with internally displaced people, 
people's needs like accommodation, humanitarian aid provision. They also think about the economic development uh, um, already now and do many other things that uh, point to the fact that Ukraine keeps its statehood despite a major damage that is occurring every single day and also now as we speak. And um, in, my, uh, in my remarks, I would like to argue is that what, what puts together the national identity and the, the self-organization capacity of the Ukrainian uh, nation as a whole is the shift towards what I would call collaborative democracy that has been occurring in Ukraine since 2014. And that is basically where we see a critical mass of citizens and public officials and entrepreneurs uh, that they share expectation mutually of partnership and they coordinate across very flexible uh, cross-sectoral networks to achieve um, solutions to, to common problems. And uh, first I want to outline uh, three conditions which uh, in my opinion have led to this uh, to the emergence of collaborative democracy trend and then i will uh, talk about how this reflects in the coping of the local authorities uh, during the times of war so the three conditions have been developing in parallel after the revolution of dignity and one year tim has already mentioned there has been the multi-level governance reform or known for the centralization reform and uh, it started in 2015 uh, ukrainian municipalities have been reorganized into larger units with better prerequisites for efficient provision of uh, uh, public services. And they have been given uh, competences to do that. But most importantly, they have received also fiscal resources and fiscal autonomy in order to uh, manage their communities. And um, in the end, this made them the legitimate go-to bodies for their local uh, communities to, to go and uh, ask for uh, to, to solving all kinds of development programs, uh, problems at the local level. So basically the reform empowered local communities to self-organize based on their needs and the context. The second uh, uh, parallel development was the participatory turn in the local government, which was empowered by transparency and uh, open data reforms. So Ukrainian cities, they opened information about um, their operations often in machine readable data, which was actually a response to the general demand uh, for anti corruption at the local level. Uh, then, also, interesting fact that uh, being transparent has become uh, like a matter of a matter of pride for local mayors and a matter of competitions. And the uh, transparency of Ukrainian municipalities has been growing according to the Transparency International's measurements. Uh, and then um, in another participatory development was, uh, for example, the participatory budget. Just in 2021, it engaged 1.2 million people across Ukraine in order to propose projects which the local authority would be then implementing. Uh, so imagine what kind of ownership it gives you over your community if this is what you can do. And um, the uh, um, interesting that local authorities before the full-scale invasion would also uh, practice the... Um, uh, collaborative approach to the local development strategy that is something that they are already thinking how to use for the recovery strategies. And the third development that has been preceding the, the resilience which we see in the war is the digital transformation. So when we go beyond open data, e-governance made receiving administrative services not just easier and comfortable, but more dignified. And this ultimately creates this respectful relations between the authorities and the government uh, and the citizens. And so with an expectation of partnerships, it creates uh, prerequisites for the same level collaboration, for same level relations, which then is the foundation for collaborative problem solving. And coming back to the digital um, uh, transformation, there were, for example, uh, digital information, uh, geo-information systems, and budget dashboards, which made literally municipal property budgets very transparent. And uh, interestingly, that these then were adapted very quickly to the needs of the war. For example, uh, geo, uh, the digital maps of uh, municipal property could be easily transferred using the same technology to digital maps of bomb shelters. And what is even more important maybe than this, these developments is the fact that around all these innovative changes, communities of practice were forming and these uh, these are people 
who are civil society, who are uh, public officials, and who are quite often also come from the entrepreneurial background, who work together across sectors on these issues. And so um, when they, um, and, and actually also some of the local authorities even uh, joined the international networks, for example, the covenant, uh, the covenant of mayors for climate and energy or open government partnership local, this all created this uh, very vast, uh, uh, expansive uh, networks of personal acquaintances that can be easily used, uh, repurposed uh, to the uh, war related needs and solving the problems. And um, with this background, so we have these three preconditions, the decentralization, the digital transformation and the participatory turn in the Ukrainian local governance. I'd like to move to the coping practices of local authorities during the full scale invasion. So what I will be telling you is based on a study which uh, we conducted together with my co-author Oksana Hus from Bologna University. And it was actually commissioned by the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe, together with the Association of Ukrainian Cities to find out what are the needs of the municipalities and how do they cope. And um, what, we, what is striking is during the war, we see that these pre-existing collaborative practices and digital governance practices, they have helped municipalities to respond to the war uh, uh, and the crisis that the war has, uh, uh, has launched at the local level. Let me remind you, there were like blackouts and uh, a big uh, internal uh, displacement, just name a few. And so um, what we found is uh, Actually, we have lots of amazing findings from this survey, but I want to stop on just uh, just three. So we uh, we identified the mechanisms of collaborative problem solving, intermunicipal cooperation, and use of digital technology as helping take this uh, this uh, civic engagement that you have just uh, and the commitment that you've just heard from Volodymyr and turn it into viable solutions against the crisis. So when we speak of the collaborative uh, governance, um, it was almost, it sounded natural and taken for granted from the, my interviews with the representatives of local authorities that these problems have to be solved collaboratively. And just give you one, I think, mind blowing example is how the Lviv IT cluster is collaborating with the air defense uh, in the Western region of Ukraine to uh, revamp and um, upgrade the air defense, air defense capabilities. But there are also other smaller examples with, uh, for example, when uh, businesses were relocating to the city of Zhitomir, they came to the local authority and said, how can we basically help us to self-organize? And the, that, the, these, I, these entrepreneurs were from the IT industry. They developed a chatbot, which they used in order to survey the needs of IDPs in, in Jatomar, after which they also um, uh, put together the businesses which were local and they re relocated in order to, to start some new uh, collaborations. Some people were ultimately even employed at the local authority. So you see this kind of openness in taking the this uh, this inner zest of the of the Ukrainian uh, people for uh, be uh, for uh, for resistance, but turn it into constructive solutions at the at the level of governance. And local authorities are serving as coordinators. Another example of the coordinative and collaborative approach is the intermunicipal corporations. Here, I would like to point that uh, according to our uh, respondents, the um, associations of Ukrainian local authorities have been very helpful in order to provide information to coordinate the response and to find uh, possible even partners abroad. So in terms when we think of recovery, we should remember that there are these collective actors that represent the interest of the Ukrainian local authorities have to be given a space at the table. Also intermunicipal, international uh, collaborations. Quite often it was enough to have a personal contact. My, my, my favorite story is uh, Bozeman, Montana, where there was a personal contact of one of the mayors and uh, the, now that person is actually in the municipality helping build uh, houses for the internally displaced people. And the whole Bozeman is uh, supporting that municipality now on a more institutional level. 
And, uh, in, uh, and finally, the third instrument is the digital tools. So chatbots, e-governance tools like Smart, uh, uh, Smart Hromada, for example, it's an e-governance platform that has been in Ukraine. They all will have been used to inform people in order uh, to save them from panic and chaos. Also, interestingly, that uh, there have been uh, messenger chats, or there still exist, of course, between professionals of, let's say, transport department in a local authority, where they jointly discuss how will they set up the workings of the, uh, of the municipality during the uh, air alerts for the transport. So this uh, self-help has been very, uh, has been empowered by the digital technology. And as a concluding remark, um, I would like to underline that when Russia launched its full-scale invasion, it did it amid the ongoing shift in social contract in Ukraine. And some would even argue exactly because of that. But what was happening is that the decentralization and anti-corruption reforms processes, they were coupled with the digital transformation and um, uh, they created this momentum for people to move away from this post-Soviet a type of relations between the citizens and state. And here what I mean is the Soviet one would mean people are subject, subjugated by the state. Post-Soviet is characterized by the detachment between the state and the citizen. And in the case of Ukraine, which I tentatively call collaborative democracy trend, is that the citizens and state are increasingly um, collaborating on so solving mutual problems. Uh, common problems. And so the question for the recovery and reconstruction is how to, is actually dual, how to empower the author the local authorities, central authorities, citizens and businesses to collaborate with each other on the equal terms and how to create spaces. So what kind of governance institutions to create so that to harness the fruits of this collaboration. Well, thanks a lot and I'll be happy to expand on any of these thoughts. Great, thank you very much. It's a really important uh, agenda for the moment and uh, for going forward. And I'd also like to remind people, uh, if you're on YouTube or watching via Zoom, uh, please feel free to uh, put questions uh, to the panelists and uh, Josh and I will be taking them and uh, uh, we'll be asking our panelists uh, once we are done with the presentations. Uh, it's my pleasure right now to introduce uh, Timothy Brick, who is the rector of the Kiev School uh, of Economics. And, you know, I, I should say that uh, Timothy is not only a uh, terrific academic who's been actively involved in the European uh, uh, Social Survey, uh, who's written broadly on sociolo sociological topics, political psychology, um, uh, interethnic relations. Uh, he's also done tremendous work with the war relief effort. And I think this is a good opportunity right now to remind people, if you're looking for uh, an organization to donate money to uh, in Ukraine, uh, Kiev School of Economics is a very, very worthy choice. I know that it's certainly my, uh, my option uh, of choice. Uh, Timofiev was a, a visiting scholar uh, at, at NYU a few years back and a frequent presence uh, around the Har Harriman Institute. And uh, uh, right now he's coming uh, uh, to us from Illinois, where he is at Northwestern University, where he's a visiting professor of international studies at the Department of Sociology and the Roberta Buffett uh, Institute. So, Timofiev, I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your very kind introduction and thank you for supporting us. Um, I think your institution has also been doing great in supporting Ukraine, Ukrainian research and students. So thank you. Thank you for, for that support. I will share my screen um, to, um, yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to say a few words and and uh, present some data on uh, on the damages to the Ukrainian economy, but also uh, if I can share a few slides um, to discuss uh, resilience of local Ukrainian communities in uh, in line with what was uh, presented by Alexandra and Vladimir. Um, uh, as uh, Tim um, generously mentioned, my organization, the Kiev School of Economics, uh, has been doing quite a lot in this uh, uh, in this effort 
to, to support our government, government, our communities, uh, the educational institution, but also the think tank. So we've been working quite a lot on collecting data on the uh, economic damages, damages to the Ukrainian economy. We, uh, we supply this data to uh, key stakeholders, local and international, but also we've been uh, sitting on many international committees, our researchers from the uh, Key School Institute, they work closely with the um, with a, a McFall Yermak initiative on sanctions uh, on Russia and many other advisory and policy making boards. So this data comes from our own um, research. Uh, we collaborate with, uh, with the government to, to produce this data and we uh, make estimates of, uh, of direct damages to Ukrainian economy. And as of, you know, our latest report uh, says, that the total direct damages were up to $143 billion. Uh, mostly uh, the most harm um, was, uh, was caused to, to residential buildings, you know, um, infrastructure like roads, uh, bridges, uh, and also quite a lot of uh, uh, social facilities uh, in public sector, like social facilities and in, the, in education, science, healthcare, they also suffered quite a lot. Um, and there are some regions that have suffered more than others. On this uh, map, you can see top 10 most affected regions of Ukraine uh, in terms of billions of uh, direct damages. Uh, nevertheless, I can say with confidence that there is no region that did not suffer at all. You know, all regions suffered, but this map shows only the top 10. Uh, obviously, those that were uh, closer to the front line, that were directly influenced by uh, Russian attack, these regions have suffered quite uh, more than others. And this, the quite a new challenge uh, in comparison to 2014 is that all regions of Ukraine, with no exceptions, they have accepted uh, quite a huge numbers of IDPs, internally displaced people in Ukraine. Uh, after 2014, when Crimea was annexed and parts of uh, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions were uh, occupied, um, mostly, um, you know, IDPs mostly uh, traveled to big cities like in Kharkiv region, in Dnipro, in Kiev. But now uh, all regions, with no exceptions, uh, are now dealing with this issue, which which actually um, um, makes local communities, local governance, a more significant social force than in the previous years of Ukrainian history, because now so many things uh, they must be done locally in terms of accepting IDPs, you know, solving logistical issues, solving supply side, uh, supply chains issues, etc. Uh, and another challenge uh, that we observe is also that the social um, social social uh, fabric has has changed uh, with respect to the structure of of uh, IDPs. You know, the the share of uh, children in the total number of IDPs has increased tremendously compared to the years before the full-scale invasion, which also means that, you know, um, um, the way how local governance has to decide their social policy uh, is also going to change quite a lot because kids, they need to have, you know, kindergartens, schools, healthcare facilities, etc. So there are a few um, uh, other slides um, I, I want to share with you, and they're based on various studies by the um, Academy of Science and the Kiev International Institute of Sociology. They have been doing quite a lot of polling uh, and they've collected quite a lot of fascinating data. And the interesting, almost paradoxical uh, situation is that during the wartime, after the full-scale invasion, we see uh, a significant increase in some attitudes and uh, worldviews of Ukrainians that... Uh, uh, that correlate with pro-social behavior, with trust, and with confidence in the, you know, in the government and the nation. So um, uh, the Academy of Science for many years have been collecting uh, data on the so-called uh, index of cynicism, social cynicism. And this index is comprised on, you know, from many questions about what people think of others, like 
whether Ukrainians believe that others tend to cheat or other people uh, cannot be trusted or other people, they're saying truth only because they're afraid uh, of consequences uh, if they're going to be caught with lies, things like that. And for many years, this index was quite you know, uh, high that uh, uh, most Ukrainians uh, were labeled as uh, um, uh, cynical individuals. And yet specifically now, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, we see a significant decline that the percentage of people who are completely or predominantly cynical has decreased, uh, while the percentage of people who are undecided or non-cynical, uh, these numbers have increased. And we observe it during the full-scale invasion. So there is some um, boost in morale and pro-social attitudes in Ukraine. Uh, this data goes uh, very much in line with what Volodymyr uh, was saying, that we also observe an increase in uh, national identities. More people identify with uh, with uh, with the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian nation. And then um, uh, there were some other surveys. Uh, this is another survey conducted by, um, by the National Academy of Science. This is the panel data. So they had a, a, a survey of um, almost, uh, let's, let's check, yeah, uh, 1,800 people. And then after the invasion, they uh, were able to reach out and collect answers of about almost 500 people from the same sample. So this is a polling um, uh, panel data. And, you know, they were asking questions about how do people, how, how do people feel? And they, they witnessed it. Uh, they registered a significant increase in anxiety, in nervousness, uh, in war-related nightmares. Way more uh, people now uh, know someone uh, who is involved uh, who, in war in one or another way, you know, through fighting or volunteering or through even uh, fa family members. So people are affected by the war uh, significantly and directly. And nevertheless, uh, you know, they, we, we observe this increased trust and increased pro-social attitudes and increased national identities. And we also observe that... Uh, uh, people value democracy. We see it from local surveys by the Razumkov Center, by the uh, Academy of Science, if uh, International Institute of Sociology, but also through research by Olga Ono and uh, Volodymyr Kulik, who, who run this, uh, uh, and Henry Hale, who, who run this uh, panel data in Ukraine. And they have observed um, that democracy is still per perceived as a uh, as most credible uh, form of governance in Ukraine. So, you know, it's a puzzle. Um, the question is why, why Ukrainians are so optimistic and pro-social during these uh, terrible times of war. And I think that uh, Volodymyr and Oleksandra both, uh, both touched on two most crucial variables that can explain what's going on in Ukraine. One is about national identification and attachment with the idea of Ukrainian nation and government. And therefore, the pro-social behavior goes through these mechanisms that people want to defend their nation and their government. But another thing uh, is, which is also very crucial, and that was Alexandra was mentioning, it's also about local governments and the way how local resources and local civil society um, and local elites um, work together in order to defend their local communities. And um, uh, this uh, graph comes from the forthcoming paper. It will be um, published in the Journal of Comparative Economics um, uh, by, uh, by myself and my colleagues. Uh, Felix Rosal uh, was very, um, you know, he, he has done a lion's share of work in this paper. So what we try to um, analyze here uh, we, we try to connect the administrative reform in Ukraine, the de, uh, decentralization reform in Ukraine, with changes in trust, in patterns in trust. So we also, uh, what we observe from cross-sectional data is that after 2015, after the decentralization uh, reform was implemented, we observe this divergence, that people 
um, persisted in their low trust to national government and uh, the levels of trust to local government increased. Uh, but this is, you know, this is just cross-sectional data and we wanted to test uh, some, um, you know, uh, statistical models to see whether we can have some um, causality inferences. So we uh, employed panel data, which comes from uh, life and transition survey, and we were able to uh, geolocate our respondents who live in different parts of Ukraine and different parts of communities. And some of them lived in the communities that were pioneers, pioneers of this reform. And we observe in our data that those people who lived in these pioneering communities who were earlier adopters of decentralization, specifically after uh, decentralization emerged, we observed that these specific respondents, they were more, more likely to trust to uh, local governance uh, but we do not observe any increase in trust to regional or national government. So yeah, we can say that the administrative reform of decentralization indeed was very um, helpful in shaping patterns of uh, local trust. And we also see that uh, it is also about uh, general social trust. We also see that in the same communities, people tend to increasingly trust uh, to their neighbors and to most people and uh, you know from from many uh, from many previous studies we know that ukraine uh, has been described as a low trust society and we see that the administrative reform of decentralization actually uh, has had a significant impact on improving uh, patterns of trust and prosocial beliefs among ukrainians so i think uh, this is the often this is an overlooked uh, variable in many research, uh, and uh, and I think we should value, uh, you know, the process of decentralization and administrative reform in Ukraine as one of the key um, structural changes which influence Ukrainians to be more, you know, satisfied with their local communities, to to trust to their local peers, and to come together uh, collectively to defend their communities. Yeah, so I think I will I will just stop here not to take your time. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for this opportunity to talk to you. And thanks. Great. Thank you very much. It's fascinating um, uh, data. And to see the, the increases in the trust in local government, um, but not in other forms of government, is kind of gives some credibility uh, to the results that there's not just some halo effect that you know, everything's better now, so we'll just increase trust uh, in everyone. And also that trust increases in the neighborhood level is also really very, uh, very interesting. Okay, thanks. In putting together this panel, I and in thinking about this problem more generally, uh, I've found it enormously helpful to talk with some experts on uh, rebuilding and reconstruction uh, after World War II in Europe, and, and particularly after um, uh, World War II in Japan. And uh, I know that the uh, Central Bank of Ukraine had th started thinking about this question very early on because they invited an economics colleague of mine who was an expert on uh, post-war reconstruction in Japan um, in March of uh, 2022, one month after the war began, there were people in the Central Bank of Ukraine already thinking about this question, and my colleague went and made a presentation to them. So I think this really shows some of the foresight um, that uh, uh, some representatives within the Ukrainian Central Bank had. Uh, today, we, we have uh, Sarah Kovner, who is uh, a senior research scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace at, at Columbia. Um, she also has her PhD from Columbia, so we're, we're especially proud to, to have her um, today. And uh, she is an expert on uh, uh, the history of Japan, and uh, her first book, uh, which won a number of awards, is Occupying Power, Sex Workers, and Servicemen in Postwar Japan. Um, and she has a new book, Prisoners of the Empire Inside Japanese POW Camps, published by Harvard University Press uh, in, in 2020. So we invited Sarah on, um, uh, not for her insights on uh, Ukraine necessarily, although she may have some, uh, but because she can bring some comparative perspective to give us some language to talk and think about the general problems of, of, of reconstruction and rebuilding uh, after war. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Sarah. 
So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, as you noted, I am a historian, so not a political scientist. And also I am a specialist in Japan. So I hope that uh, what I have to say is at least um, poses some questions and ways of thinking about things. And again, thank you to everyone. Um, so I mentioned I'm a historian and I'm teaching a class at Columbia right now called History for Policymakers. And um, one of the things that we talk about in this class is how difficult it is to use historical analogies correctly and how important it is to carefully consider your choices. So we look at case studies like Pearl Harbor, the Marshall Plan, McCarthyism, and so on, and all the ways that analogies can actually be confusing or misleading. And um, so that's just to say the Allied occupation of Japan isn't an obvious analogy for any post-war rebuilding in Ukraine, perhaps even less relevant than it was for post-war rebuilding in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, which was a, an example of, I think, some problems with analogies. But I do think that thinking about the ways in which it's different can help us think through the situation in Ukraine in a critical and creative ways. Um, and as, as I was at the beginning, at today, the outset of today's panel and talking about and thinking about the ideas for what kinds of wholesale change, change are even possible, or at least were in Japan in at the end of World War II. Um, in planning what I was going to talk about today, Anton suggested some food for thought, uh, international partners in post-war development, how a society that's been through a long war and militarization reinvents itself, how it learns to think about a different future, and so on. And so what I thought I would do today is talk, briefly review some relevant features of the post-war Japanese context, because I'm not sure how familiar with it, this audience is with um, 20th century Japanese history. Um, and also, and this is in some ways to show how this history may not be relevant, or maybe it will be. Um, so in August 1945, and this is something probably everybody does know, the Japanese were defeated by the Allies. Um, the Allies had a total victory, and Japan had utter defeat after years of war. Um, and Japan had really been at war, had been at war with China since 1937 um, and had been um, battling across Asia much earlier. But so later in later at the end of August in that month, an allied occupation, which is run by the U.S., but includes other allied powers, takes control until 1952. And the allies led by the U.S., this is a group of when I say allies, this is a range of people, a range of powers with a range of um, power. Um, they run an international civil military occupation that helps the Japanese rebuild their country. Um, but it's an occupation. And though Japanese men and women are involved in enacting the reforms, there's no doubt about who's in control. And it's the United States. And so with this slogan of democratize and demilitarize, the occupation takes an enormous commitment and capital and enacts widespread military, political, economic, and social reforms. These include a new constitution, which guarantees new civil rights, weakens the role of the police, and places sovereignty in the hands of the people. Um, this constitution also gives rights to women and abolishes Japan's military, right? So Japan doesn't, by constitution, um, Article 9 doesn't have a military, even though they do have some form of military today. Uh, so, and then the, another major reform that's often pointed to is land reform, uh, which redistributes land from the big landlords to tenant farmers. Um, they allow free trade unions, and there's an effort to break up big companies. So all of this is um, by way of thinking about change, and Japan's willingness to make these reforms is often explained in terms of defeat or occupation. But um, historians of Japan have also shown how in many ways occupation authorities advocated reforms that Japanese men and women had long supported. And the defeat of the militarists empowered them to take charge. Uh, so I wanted to talk about that. And also um, another important result of the war and one that's been getting increasing attention from historians of Japan was the end of Japan's overseas empire and the forced repatriation of millions of Japanese citizens. So Japan, like Germany, had to renounce um, claims to lots of territory that it had occupied for many decades and was part of its country, um, its empire, as part of the post-war peace settlement. Um, so that is like my short Japan introduction. And I have a few thoughts um, that are things that I was thinking about, at least, about how this might help us understand any kind of post-war rebuilding in Ukraine. And I, um, as I've already said, I, I 
not an expert in Ukraine, but these are some things I was thinking about. So the first thing I was thinking about is um, in reading kind of the uh, in reading about the conflict, um, many of it concluded that it will be challenging for Ukraine to regain all the territories that it's lost to Russia, even though this is difficult to think about. Um, and so if, if this is true, if the war can't end without any kind of compromise um, over the Donbass or, or, or at least Crimea, one that would mean that significant numbers of Ukrainians wouldn't be able to return to the, place, the places where they've long resided. And um, so this is in many ways difficult to even consider. But one thing that I was thinking about is that the post-World War II recovery of Japan as well as Germany could provide an example of how countries that suffer significant military defeat and major territorial losses are able to survive or even thrive. So that's um, one analogy I can think of. Um, but in, in both of these cases that I've just mentioned, these require international partners in post-war development. Um, and another element of the post-World War II settlement is demilitarization. And um, in some cases, and now I'm going beyond Japan and Germany, this is all, all to talk about Austria neutralization. And I think that Ukraine will almost certainly strive to strengthen its military to deter future Russian aggression and will actively seek its NATO membership. But when we look at uh, this post-World War II settlement in Japan, Germany, show, this also shows some ways that limits might be placed on these plans, at least initially, and without precluding Ukraine eventually freeing itself from such restrictions and perhaps even entering into an alliance with NATO allies at a more precipitous moment. So, um, of course, the case of Japan shows that this might take a long time. But one benefit of being a historian is that you can take the long view. So um, those are just some quick thoughts for me, and I, uh, I can, I'm happy to answer any kinds of questions on Japan that anyone might have. Thank you for including me. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks to all the panelists for these incredibly insightful remarks. There's a ton of food for thought here. I want to remind our, our viewers the Q&A button is open. You can leave questions that are there. Um, and also on YouTube, you can use the chat for questions. <laughs> I want to kick off <laughs> with a question that's fairly similar uh, for Alexandra and for Voloja, and I think for Timothy as well, but I'm going to start by posing it to Alexandra. The, the developments you've talked about, I'm trying to put on my like 1990s fieldwork hat, you know, going to Ukraine in the late 90s. They're, they're pretty spectacular, right? And if we think generally about reforms in countries that are, you know, that we're trying to move to more open societies, more fair, more just societies. It, what you're giving us is a huge kind of story of success here. Um, you know, it sounds like what we often say is like, these are the goals that we're trying to achieve. And then here's the program we're going to say that didn't succeed. And I guess the question that I want to ask you is about all of these kind of developments around, you um, around local community empowerment, around people feeling more a part of their community, all these successes you've talked about. As we think about both the future of Ukraine and the larger extrapolation of the lessons from what we've learned, there are two factors that have changed rather dramatically in the last you know, few years in Ukraine. Like one factor is the election of an outsider as president, the, the, the election of a new political party, a kind of throwing out of the old corrupt elites, you know, in the way that we, you know, that we hypothesize all the time and normatively think democracy should work, that the people can can be dissatisfied with their elites, get new leadership and get something new. But but the results seem to be dramatically different than, say, after the Orange Revolution. Um, and of course, the other is the war. So to what extent do you think these changes that we've seen in Ukrainian society are a function of the change in political leadership? the invasion by Russia or the intersection of those two? Like were they, which of these were, are they, were they both necessary? Were they each sufficient? You know, so what, what has driven this kind of really rather dramatic development? Should I go I ahead, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah go okay. ahead, please. So thanks for, thanks for this. This is a fantastic question. It's, um, for me, the answer is like this. So the change in the political leadership in 2019 is a product of the changes that have been taking place, at least starting from the Orange Revolution and that have um, accelerated after the revolution of dignity, not the other way around. Of course, if we, had, we have a new leadership in 2019, 
it creates then new opportunities. It's again an acceleration, but I would not call it a reason for, for the changes that uh, we are observing. Also because uh, the decentralization reform has been on the agenda at least uh, since 2008 or nine, even if not before. So there is a really good book by Valentina Romanova where she reconstructs uh, the policy dialogue about the decentralization reform. So it's one thing. Another is uh, you were asking what um, what what may have been the, uh, the 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 reason if it is not the uh, leader uh, political leadership. So in in my opinion, it is um, and what has changed after the uh, the what is was different between the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity. Uh, there is a learning curve in the civil society in Ukraine that. Uh, after the Orange Revolution, there was a sense that now we have put the good guy in the in the steering wheel and uh, we can go home. And this uh, has created massive problems. There has been uh, power struggles between the oligarchic groups as well, which on the one hand prevented centralization and uh, a drift towards authoritarianism. But on the other hand, they created uh, for the for the people, they created a sense of chaos, and um, there was even an increase in in a sense of in the perception of the uh, breadth of corruption. So that is, there were a lot of um, even internal factors how Yanukovych could become a president, even when we uh, remove the Russian influence uh, from from the picture. But after the revolution of dignity, there was a sense that we have to do something and the, uh, the civil society organizations formed the reanimation package of reforms. You might have heard about it. That is a, a coalition which has uh, had uh, um, already plans in place, which they wanted to use the momentum and uh, introduce it in the parliament and then they monitor the implementation. And um, at the local level, simultaneously, there was a shift in, towards more constructive communication where the people uh, and the businesses and the authorities, again, coming from very networks which are very hard to even grasp. Uh, I, I tried, to, I wrote a chapter now trying to grasp these networks in Eve, and it's very hard, but they have uh, multiple hats. And uh, these people then collaborate in a very constructive way um, where, because they see the bigger picture which they want to create. So in Lviv, it was no less than to become a uh, Eastern European IT hub, right? They did, their ambition was not even in Ukraine or has been, it is still like that. So uh, to wrap up, there was a, a change in shift in how people communicate and in the underlying values, why they communicate and it has, uh, happened almost simultaneously within the active parts of the civil society, the entrepreneurs, especially I'm talking uh, small and medium enterprises, and the public officials, which we call, call pro-reform public officials. Alexandra, so then am I, you know, correct in interpreting your answer to that is that this is a model that's exportable to other countries, that it is not a function of the peculiar um, developments in Ukraine, especially in response to the what we've seen with the invasion, is that is that a correct assumption, the correct interpretation of what you've just said here? I think in German we would say "jein," which means yes and no, because <laughs> maybe Volodymyr can talk about it. I think it has something to do with the development of the national identity, which maybe is harder to fix or like to steer, but there are certain ways which you can export. And for example, creating cross-sectoral communication pl platforms and facilitating discussions about what are we all here doing and what is our bigger goal, that is possible. Great, great. that's a perfect segue to the next question, which I wanted to ask Loja about, which is again, this question of how much of these developments that you're showing us here do you think are a function of the invasion? Uh, going back to 2014, but uh, of course the full-scale invasion in 2022, and I've long followed you know, the work that you've been doing with Olya, and you know, I know the argument is that this is proceeding, you know, this is something that's been developing, that's been developing over years. Um, but as we look to the future, I mean, on the one hand, you know, you mentioned it as, or you or Timothy both said, like, you know, it's puzzling that during the time of the war, you see this more inclusive identity. On the other hand, if we take it as like, I'm a public, as a public opinion scholar, right? Rally around the flag. We've long known that in, you know, you get increased support for leaders during times of international conflict. Now, 
inclusivity is it the same thing as rally around the flag that's a that's a complex question but i think there's another way of putting it well well this isn't a puzzle you, you're going to ask public opinion survey during a war you're going to see elevated support for some sort of the leader the idea of the country something like that so i would be interested in either of your takes in the sense that like ukraine does have this long history of antagonism you know or civil civil strife civil conflict um disagreement politically over some of these issues. And I wonder the extent to which you think this is a rally, you know, contrast the idea that this is a rally around the flag effect of this is about the war and after the war, we should expect this unity to to, to diminish or Volodya, looking at the time series data that Timothy put up and that you and Olya have presented many times, this is a longstanding trend that the war may be accelerated but that we shouldn't expect it to dissipate after the, when the war comes to a conclusion. Thanks, uh, Jain. Uh, I, <laughs> I, that's, a, that's a good pattern, you know, we can, we can all say this magic word and then um, be done with it. So um, I would say it's a, long, it's a long-term pattern. It will not disappear after the, after the victory. Although, of course, the, uh, the victory will um, will remove some constraints on on manifestation of disagreements. Yeah. So uh, disagreements will be will will be manifested more more um, uh, openly, maybe more vehemently. Uh, but uh, the consolidation of society uh, is a long-term uh, long-term trend, and the um, civic understanding of Ukrainian identity is a long-term trend. And um, rallying around the flag uh, uh, often uh, is limited to a majority. And at the same time, as the majority becomes more uh, assertive of their civic identity, the minorities may resort to, to, uh, to, to their minority ethnic identities or even to global identities as an alternative to, 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 to national identity. Nothing like that is happening in Ukraine, um, uh, as, uh, as far as we can, we can say by, by looking at the poll data with, with limited N. Yeah, But um, what I'm saying is that um, uh, you, uh, the, the civic, the civic Ukrainian identity uh, started with uh, in in ninety one, and it was developing, and it was kind of um, um, uh, uh, reinforced by by the two revolutions, and uh, by uh, and as Alexandra mentioned, the experience, the lessons learned from from the Euromaidan revolution were were different, were better learned uh, than 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 from the Orange Revolution, but. Uh, uh, I would, uh, in 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 in, in uh, uh, looking back at your previous question, I would say it's it's not related to to Zelensky victory. Um, it's it's not it's not as a magical removal of the corrupt elites. Uh, many corrupt elites survived, and 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 some of the cynicism in society with regard with regard to uh, uh, what society can do about about the corruption in also survived. Uh, and and the perseverance of of of, um, of the active part of society of the, what we normally call civil society yeah also uh, also survived but uh, uh, maybe even uh, get, uh, got stronger uh, but what what the war added to that is this uh, huge kind of uh, outrage and and alienation and hostility so clearly delimitation of of of, of where we where where are we and where are them. And, and and that's uh, that's why it became easier for for Ukrainians to overcome all these ambiguities, uh, all, all these hesitancies, all this yes and no, all, all this yain. Yeah. So in 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 this way, uh, in this way, I, I I believe that this shock is so strong that it will definitely survive the victory and and the some temptations which will uh, uh, emerge after the victory. Yeah, thanks. That was terrific. I, I wanted to jump in here um, in part because I had a question and Ralph Clem has a, a question as well in the chat, which I can easily incorporate into my question, um, which is, you know, we've heard three fairly positive uh, uh, takes on where Ukraine is right now and where it's likely to go forward, that the changes, whether it's local government or identity, um, are likely to be long lasting. Um, can I ask any of you to talk to me or talk to us about what worries you? What are the things that you think uh, might be problematic going forward? And Ralph Clem uh, uh, mentions one, which is that uh, after the war, you know, there will be regional differentiation 
in uh, economic investment and uh, standards of living across regions are likely to uh, increase. And you know that might be one thing uh, to worry about. Um, uh, you know, the reemergence of uh, corruption, you know, the politics after wars often become uh, much more divisive as Winston Churchill, who, you know, uh, was quite popular during the war, but uh, post-war, you know, public opinion turned very quickly. So um, this is really um, contra to my persona as an op optimist. Um, but I want to just ask each of you to think a little, or any of you, uh, think about what worries you uh, uh, going forward. Okay. You want to... yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I, 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 at least I can try to speculate about it because, of course, there are a lot of things that we are worried about, and I'll try to think, you know, as a sort of uh, also using many hats as a sociologist. Uh, but also policymaker and from a perspective of political science. So, of course, as a sociologist, I would, I would, uh, um, I, I would think a lot about socioeconomic inequalities, uh, access to education, access to healthcare, to uh, uh, labor market. Um, just to give you a comparison with the 2014. There was a paper published by our colleagues, um, Hanna Bahitova, she's an economist, and she studied labor market discrimination. She was able to identify uh, individuals who were displaced from uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region, and she compared them against uh, you know, other individuals in, uh, in the same territories. And after controlling for many factors, she concluded that uh, household heads who were displaced they had uh, they were twenty percent uh, least likely to be employed. So there was this effect of uh, discrimination in two thousand fourteen, and the reason why I'm bringing this paper is because she said something very interesting in the introduction. She said that in contrast to many other countries, these IDPs or they uh, lived in urbanized areas. They moved to big cities like Kharkiv, Dnipro. They had access to, you know, labor, to market, to to information, to technology. So, uh, but now in 2023, you know, 24, and so on, we have a completely new situation when so many people, IDPs, they're moving to completely new places with, uh, you know, they're often uh, very far away from access to technology and labor. There are new uh, towns that are built from the scratch specifically to accommodate these people. So these are new types of challenges, which we have never seen before. And they inevitably will bring new types of uh, socioeconomic inequalities. And uh, of course, I'm very worried about that. Uh, from the kind of policy perspective, I'm worried about this balance between centralization and decentralization. As a scholar, I see a lot of merit in uh, decentralization. You know, we, we just talked that decentralization was this uh, pillar of uh, civic participation, democracy, um, uh, local trust. And at the same time, we know, you know, from studies in economics and from policy research that usually war economies are more successful when they are centralized uh, for uh, supply chains, for security reasons, for coordination and communication. Centralization makes a lot of sense. So I think there will be this, um, you know, uh, political debate uh, about the, you know, this uh, uh, going into centralization versus decentralization, and uh, we don't know where it's going to go. Uh, and as a, from sort of a political science perspective, you know that we just mentioned this uh, rally around the flag effects and um, polarization and things like that. Well, I'm I'm also a bit worried about that because I can also bring another stream of the literature. As a sociologist, I know that there is a huge literature about values and culture. And from this literature, we know that Ukrainians are quite homogeneous. So from the, you know, from this perspective of fundamental values and beliefs and social norms, uh, Ukrainians in different places, in urban and rural areas, in Western and Eastern Ukraine, they're quite homogeneous. 
and yet they can fight each other in terms of political attitudes. You know, they often disagree with each other on political attitudes because these political attitudes are often driven by local, you know, idiosyncratic uh, circumstances like local media, local economy, local oligarchs that shape uh, discourses, and etc. And since the war creates a lot of uh, uncertainty with this idiosyncratic uh, context. We, we, we kind of don't know what's going to happen. So uh, in, in terms of future um, political polarization. So I would worry about these three things. Yeah. That's great, really. Vladimir, do you want to jump in or? Wow, OK. Yeah. Uh, again, three things. Um, as a scholar of uh, ethnicity and, and, uh, and, and language, I, I, I am a bit worried about how uh, this might end up with um, uh, a kind of marginalization and maybe even discrimination of, of, of Russian speakers. Uh, so much outrage, so much, so much discontent there is with the long-term uh, privileges for Russian language and, and, and Russian speakers. So, so much, um, so strong a perceived relation between uh, uh, um, uh, privileges for Russian speakers and the, the issue of uh, per, uh, supposed alleged discrimination of Russian speakers and Russian in, Russia's impact on Ukraine, that, that um, you, um, you, the bulk of Ukrainian society can go too far. And, and sometimes it seems like, like, like it, it, might, it might happen. There is, uh, there is a kickback. There, 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 there are voices which, which are constantly raising this discussion against this, um, uh, uh, this uh, kind of overextension of, 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 uh, uh, of Ukrainian language agenda. But uh, there is a, a bit of worry um, if, if you look at different societies which, we, we, which went through this. Um, as a citizen, I am concerned uh, that Enormous popularity that Zelensky gained during the war, and especially the one who did not flee, the one who, who did not want um, uh, a ride but wanted munition, you know, um, might might be abused after the victory uh, for, for, for the sake of, of the uh, uh, enrichment and empowerment of his inner circle. Uh, uh, so you, 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 can, you, can, you, you can remind yourself that Tatarov is still not ousted uh, of the presidential administration and, and people like, like him, yeah. And uh, war or no war, uh, some people are, are, are too valuable for Zelensky and so he keeps them. And, and, and if anything, Yermak even, even accumulated more power than, than before the war. Uh, so how uh, how this might might play after the war with with, with billions of, of of dollars of of inter international help and 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 uh, uh, marginalization of, of opposition and so on. So uh, if anything, uh, I would I would rather want uh, us to be uh, Britain in forty five with, with with Churchill ousted uh, rather than not want <laughs> that. And and, and 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 a third uh, worry, as a, a third concern, as an intellectual, I am I am dismayed by by, uh, by the uh, uh, low value of expertise in the uh, in, in society. Uh, so, uh, uh, so so many people with very little knowledge, but which which simple answer to all questions became uh, become extremely popular uh, and and become much more heard and 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 respected and 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 listened to uh, than, than people who earn their expertise with, with hard work. So of course it's not unique a uniquely Ukrainian process. Of course it's it's universal. You know you know that. But I'm more concerned about Ukraine. Sorry guys. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I jump in? Yeah, please. Yeah. Of course. So I, I think I'm not exactly the worrying type and I don't have that many hats, but there are several things I think we have to bear in mind also in line what Timofi and Volodymyr have been saying. This centralization, decentralization, this is not for a two poles because decentralization can be made um, Functional, uh, functional, efficient, and agile uh, if it is done through networks and if there is a constant feedback loops between the actors and the levels. And we, we see the practice of it already working in Ukraine, for example, in the Rivne uh, Regional Military Administration set up a coordination council for the IDP matters. 
where all the heads of the local uh, uh, municipalities are part of. And so they share data, they share needs, they quickly organize where they can place more people and so on. So this, this type of agile coordination can offset the problem of chaos and disorganization that can happen in decentralized settings. But its perks are much uh, more advantageous than the risks we would have if we go for centralization. Exactly because also what Volodymyr was tell telling. So it is worth putting the safeguards when we do the uh, institutional setup for the recovery that creates this kind of uh, horizontal coordination platforms. And for that, it is also important that the funding lines do not go directly only into the state agency, but that there is a separate buckets reserved for the um, municipal uh, authorities. And that also we have uh, uh, for the municipal authorities and their territorial partnerships or even clusters. So which can be then used uh, um, in um, independently of the central government and let's say ukraine already has a very strong cluster movement and we have a, even an alliance of clusters so there is a possibility and it, it already exists and the, the donors have to empower these kind of uh, self-organization through flexible networks in order to offset this decentralization that can be chaotic and speaking of um, what what maybe also worries me is um if we move, especially donors move too fast into the efficiency in expense of inclusivity and this collaborative democracy that is developing at the local level. What I mean, there is a tendency, and I see that also in the very interesting piece that has been shared with us, is the tendency to look at so-called objective data without putting so much attention and even objective data about people's education and stuff like that. We know it doesn't matter as much in Ukraine for innovation and uh, also in other places. So it means that um, recovery has to take the advantage of the social capital and actually have a belief that people can uh, take the best out of resources that they have, provided that they have good resources, facilitation and all other means uh, that we've been talking about. And so not to jump too fast into the efficiency. And this is my last point, which is connected to the efficiency uh, of spending funds. Um, a lot of people are concerned with corruption, which is of course a reasonable concern, uh, but the, the reactions, uh, and I have been on my other hat, I've, I've been researching corruption and anti-corruption together with my co-author, Oksana Hus. And what we see, there is a tendency to just install controls to have this zero tolerance anti-corruption policies, which creates a lot of bureaucratic burdens, controls of controllers and of controllers, which is not efficient anymore. And uh, a second one is the tendency to remove the uh, the oligarchs. So oligarchs are seen, uh, are seen as the pro biggest problem of Ukraine, so they're all anti-oligarchic laws. Let's not forget that because we had oligarchs, there were multiple centers of power and Ukraine has not become an authoritarian country like Russia did. Russian uh, president and his inner circle, they used state resources, which they centralized in order to create the monster that is killing people in Ukraine right now. So question is, if we don't want oligarchs, what is the alternative? And the alternative, in my opinion, has to be sought in the small, medium and large enterprises commit to the values of integrity. And again, they exist in Ukraine. They have to be put together on the table at to the table and empowered. And the question is, how do we do it through all this funding that is going to come through through our general donors? Thanks. Uh, that's a great segue to a question I have for Sarah, um, which is, uh, could you talk a little bit about what people's expectations were for Japan after the war? I ask because when you ask people about Ukraine's future, you get some that are unbelievably optimistic, like Ukraine's gonna be the darling of the international investment community. Companies are already lining up to take advantage of its geographic location, well-educated public, low labor costs, blah, blah, blah. Then you have other people say, oh my God, you know, look, the, the, the war damage has been so great. It's gonna take decades uh, for Ukraine to recover. It's lost so much. Uh, you know, capital, human capital that's gone abroad. And once people go abroad and they stay abroad for a long period of time, it's difficult to get them to come back. 
And, uh, you know, the, the global economy is very different than it was after, after World War, you know, you, you can come up with, so you have these really divergent views of what Ukraine's future is going to be like. And I'm interested in like, what was the, what were the expectations in Japan? In part, because these expectations are important for shaping behavior about foreign investors who are, you know, if they see other foreign investors or other foreign governments hesitating to help, uh, then they're less likely to go in themselves. So these expectations are really important. And I'm wondering if there's anything we learn about the, the Japanese case, uh, about expectations going into the reconstruction compared to what actually happened. So um, I take your question to mean expectations on the part of people outside Japan or people yeah, within yeah, Japan? Yeah, yeah, okay. outside Japan. Yeah, thanks, if, if I may. Okay. You can take uh, it wherever you want, but, but that, that, was, that was the heart of the question. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, um, I think that one thing to remember, and maybe this is relevant for the Ukraine situation, is that um, Japan looks really different in 1952, in 1962, 1972, 82, 92, in the present, when it's like the world's third largest economy, but it like, took a really long time to get there. And I mean, you know, I am old enough to have been in high school when uh, the worry was that the Japanese were, you know, taking over New York. So like, I think where we think of Japan today is like, uh, you know, that that's pretty distant and would have, I think, been inconceivable to many people in 1945, perhaps. Um, so that would be one thing. So the future is limitless, right? I mean, I guess we could say that. I think that um, to the extent that America, like just, just sticking with Americans right now, the extent that Americans were thinking about Japan, it was like a small group of people within the State Department who were planning an occupation, as you know, as I'm sure you know, um, occupation for um, many years. And I think also Japan. Um, if I had to guess, was much less a center of focus for the world than Ukraine is now, right? Like, mm -hmm. and and a problem. Um, so I don't know if, if that's helpful at all, except to say that the people who were thinking about it, I think, um, had, and the people who went in from the United States to reform Japan to be as part of the civil aspect, civil part of the allied occupation, had tremendous hopes for democratization. And I've spoken to some of them um, years ago, but, and they really, had um you know sky high belief and hope that anything could happen so i'll leave it there oh good okay. that's great that's Eric, not what i expected i have to say so josh yeah can i just push on that just a one a little bit sorry like so one thing that's come out of this discussion here is that ukraine has had this democratic resurgence i mean has had 30 years of dem democracy and it's and it has had this whole kind of push towards you know trust and local accountability and all these things in the lead up to the war, right? Japan was a very autocratic society in the lead up to the war. So I wonder if there's any insights you can give to us that, you know, Japan had to engage in simultaneously economic reconstruction and essentially building, I mean, I don't know anything about Japan, Japanese history, but I'm assuming from this discussion, essentially building dem democracy and the foundations of democracy from scratch, or at least from a very, uh, for a, a position where it had been sort of completely subjugated to autocratic rule for a period of time. What opportunities do you think this presents to Ukraine potentially that it already has this democratic scaffolding uh, in place? And if anything, democracy seems to have strengthened in recent years heading into this period of time. Okay, so I would say to that, that um, it's while it's of course true that Japan has a militarist government from the 1930s until, you know, 1945, there's like a lot of uh, democratic activism, and it's not as if there's, I, mean, I, don't, I don't really know enough about Ukraine to make a direct analogy, but it's not as if there was no democracy or people who didn't know about democracy. And so one of the reasons that Japan scholars think that, or historians of Japan think that the occupation may have been so successful is that there were all of these people in Japan who had been wanting democracy, and they were able to, and the people in the Allied occupation were able to work together with the people on the ground for democracy. Um, does that make so, so, you, so you know when you read about um, you read about like so people have big ideas the Americans or the Australians have big ideas and then um, it is really the men and women on the ground who had been writing constitutions and thinking about things for a while or working locally who make these um, reforms and but I mean uh, so in terms of you I think that the other thing to say I guess is that as you say, it's, I think, true that I think that the Japanese society was um, so devastated and 
the economy and politics were so devastated at the end of the Second World War that in some ways, um, I mean, and, and, you know, we're in the middle of things, so who knows what's what's going to happen. But, um, you know, that there was uh, a space in some ways to have these big ideas. And um, let me just leave it there. Fantastic. All right. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for, for joining this panel and for offering these insights. It's we, we, you know, we try to sometimes drop people into these difficult seats and it's not the easiest thing to be surrounded by such expertise uh, who is here, who's here today. Um, for our other three panelists, uh, we're almost at the end, but if you wanted to just take quickly, <laughs> like in 30 seconds, what is the one thing that you think is most important for people outside of Ukraine who may be watching or watching this video in the future to know about Ukraine to ensure, you know, a successful transition along this reconstruction line. If there's like one key point that you think that's important that people should know outside. And I realize that's a that's a tough one to ask, but just before we close, you can also say that's a ridiculous question, Josh, but if you had a chance, all right, Belogio will at least try to answer it, okay. Uh, the most important thing at the moment to, to remember that before victory, there is the fight. And, and 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 we are not there yet. Um, we we are fighting, and we are, and 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 Ukrainians are dying, and Ukraine needs help. So uh, it is important to see what happens next. It's important to be prepared. It's important to accumulate resources. But right now, resources help and and political will and and, and support for for, for for politicians manifesting this will I and mean, popular support are needed for 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 ensuring that Ukraine actually wins. Thank you. Thank you. Timothy or Alexandra, would you like to add? Yeah, absolutely. That was actually something that I wanted to say myself as well. So uh, there is a strong consensus among you know, Ukrainian civil society, academics, um, people who work in culture. Every time we are out there speaking to the wider audience, we uh, try to send a message that, you know, war is still on, Ukrainians are still dying. And it may sound a bit weird here at the academic venue, but we need military support. So we advocate for military support and it is still a crucial point for us. Alexandra, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, and what's important to remember is that Ukraine must win. And it's a question of how the world can make it happen faster and sooner. That's why we need the weapons and we want air defense systems and whatever long range missiles and everything that the air commander asks for. And uh, Russia must learn to lose. And the world has also learned and get, a, get accustomed to the fact that Russia will lose and not make any kind of uh, ideas about territorial concessions, compromises, and stuff like that. Ukraine wins, Russia loses, and that is the only way for all of us to live in a world in a rule-based Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank the audience for joining us. I found this enormously uh, useful. I learned a ton and I also am extremely appreciative of everyone taking their time, especially uh, those of you who are joining us from difficult situations. Um, I want to just give a quick shout out to uh, the next event in the New York City Russia Public Policy Series that is sponsored jointly by the Harriman Institute and by NYU. We're going to have Deborah Javelin discussing her new book, After Violence, The Beslan School Massacre, and the piece that followed. She'll be joined by Elena Milashina, a Russian journalist who's formerly of Novaya Gazeta, uh, who has covered Beslan extensively. And this will mark actually our first return to an in-person New York City Russia Public Policy Series event, which will be hybrid. So there'll be plenty of opportunities for people to join, but that will be on May 4th and it will be in the afternoon, 4 p.m. held at Columbia University. So I'm gonna to toss it to Tim for the last word, but thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Josh did a terrific job wrapping up. Just wanna thank the panelists. Thank everyone for listening in and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thanks very much, everybody.